Good morning from Perth, Western Australia. On behalf of Alice F. Fleming and myself, Saul Harlan, welcome to today's webinar, At the Edge of the Cliff, When JobKeeper Ends. Alistair and I are meeting today in Perth, and we wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on. The Wajak people, we wish to acknowledge and, res and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. I'd like to introduce my co-presenter today, Alistair Fleming. Alistair practices in commercial litigation and corporate restructuring and insolvency. He has specialist expertise in all aspects of financial distress, including formal and informal insolvency and restructuring processes, the director's safe harbour and ipso facto legislative regimes and PPSA disputes. Companies, financiers, external administrators, creditors, investors and restructuring and turnaround professionals come to him for advice in situations of corporate crisis and distress across most industry sectors, including mining and resources, oil and gas, construction, property, financial markets, communications, agriculture and aged care. And my name is Saul Harbin. I'm a partner and the National Practice Group Leader in the Workplace Relations, Employment and Safety Practice Group. This year I've been heavily involved in assisting clients adjust to changes in their operating environment due to COVID-19. In response to the World Health Organization declaring COVID-19 a pandemic early in 2020, the Australian and state governments rapidly escalated their responses and imposed never before experienced restrictions on citizens' ability to travel, socialise and attend for work. Businesses have had to be proactive, creative and understanding. Then on 30 March 2020, the Commonwealth Government announced its JobKeeper wage subsidy scheme, under which businesses impacted by COVID-19 were able to access a subsidy to continue paying their employees so long as they met certain criteria. On 21 July 2020, the Government announced an extension to JobKeeper in the form of JobKeeper 2.0. And on the 7th of August 2020, the Government announced that eligibility requirements for JobKeeper 2.0 would be eased in the face of the severe economic impacts being experienced in Victoria. Today, Alistair and I will be discussing the employment, financial and business consequences associated with the anticipated end of JobKeeper 2.0 on the 28th of March next year. I say anticipated because there may well be need for government to consider a JobKeeper 3.0 depending upon how we emerge from COVID-19 over the next six months. Alistair will be discussing the responses from the government which have allowed businesses to continue to trade through the COVID-19 pandemic and what actions businesses, both large and small, can take to best protect themselves. I'll be looking at the employment aspects of getting staff to return to work, the work health and safety issues that will need to be considered, and planning around any necessary changes to working arrangements, including flexibility options and restructuring. Today's webinar will be in an interview format, commencing with a series of questions I'll pose to Alistair. Finally, today's webinar is interactive and participants can submit questions at any time during the webinar via our Q&A tool on screen, which we'll either answer during the webinar or if we run out of time, we can separately follow up on. So let's get into it, Alistair. JobKeeper aside, what are some of the key government relief measures which have, been, which have assisted to support companies during this COVID period? Thank you, Saul, and, uh, and good morning uh, to those on the call and, uh, and afternoon, depending on uh, uh, where you are around Australia. Uh, look, uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, measures, both um, federally and at the state level, uh, that the, uh, the respective governments have introduced uh, throughout this period uh, with a view to, uh, to supporting uh, business. Probably the, uh, the, the key measures uh, which I have seen from, a, I guess, a practical perspective uh, in the insolvency um, sector um, have been firstly the temporary relief uh, for directors from insolvent trading. Um, now that's quite an important one because um, directors uh, can be held personally liable for uh, debts that they cause a company to incur um, at a time when the company is insolvent. Uh, that's a, a civil liability but in certain circumstances that can be uh, also a criminal liability uh, and that is often a, a significant factor uh, to deter uh, directors from continuing to trade a business while it's insolvent or, or nearing insolvency and, and often to encourage directors to actually 
put a company into voluntary administration or do something about it. Um, so one of the measures the government has introduced is to provide directors with relief from that civil liability at this point in time. Um, that has extended until the end of uh, this calendar year. Um, secondly, uh, with a view to um, uh, making it more difficult for creditors to um, uh, enforce uh, or to come after a company that's suffering some financial distress, um, there have been measures uh, put in place to increase uh, thresholds for enforcement action. Um, for instance, with uh, statutory demands, uh, the monetary threshold for a demand has increased from $2,000 to $20,000. Uh, and also, rather than a 21-day time period uh, to comply with that demand, uh, the time period has now been extended to, uh, to six months. Uh, that's for companies. Now, for individuals, uh, from a bankruptcy perspective, um, there's also been an increase uh, in the monetary threshold from $5,000 to $20,000, uh, and also a similar uh, extension to the time period of, um, of six months. Uh, I think another key uh, measure which has assisted companies is to do with their, um, their uh, leasing arrangement. Um, there have been uh, measures put in place to impose restrictions on landlords from terminating leases, uh, relying on a, a non-payment default uh, in circumstances where that non-payment is uh, related to um, you know, COVID uh, related type causes. So that has enabled a number of uh, uh, businesses uh, who may have ordinarily struggled to maintain their rental property uh, to continue renting that property during that, um, that period of time. Um, we'll talk about JobKeeper uh, in, in due course and the, um, the, the changes um, through JobKeeper 2.0. Um, but uh, I guess another of, um, uh, another a couple of factors to acknowledge here um, is in relation to um, the actions that the ATO and, and some of the, uh, the key banks and financial institutions have taken during this time. Uh, there have been a number of um, ATO deferrals uh, assisting uh, businesses and individuals uh, to um, uh, keep their tax obligations up to date uh, by reason of deferrals or, or repayment. Uh, arrangements uh, during this period. So that has eased some of the pressure on companies in, and individuals. Uh, and also to the banks and the financial institutions, uh, they have allowed uh, deferrals on, uh, on repayment of, um, of debt and facilities. So I think a combination of all of those types of factors have provided a, uh, a period of, of pause uh, whereby a number of businesses which ordinarily may have faced solvency type situations um, to continue on trading with a view to potentially coming out of this in an okay position. So it sounds like there's a number of different things that have been done which uh, companies will have to keep an eye on and company directors will need to keep an eye on in terms mm -hmm. of when these varying um, relief measures come to an end so that yes. they can make sure they're across all the detail on each yes. of those yes. items you've outlined. All right, and how effective have those relief measures been, Alistair, in minimising the risk of a corporate insolvency in your experience? Yeah, look, I think I think that um, the measures have been reasonably effective, uh, but effective in terms of providing a, a pause or a period of moratorium. Um, they they are not measures which are designed to to fix or solve a, a problem, but they have bought time. Um, now, the reason they have bought time here is because um, fundamentally, in in Australia and under Australian law. Uh, Insolvency is the uh, inability of a company or a, an individual to pay their debts as and when they fall due. Um, when a uh, company is uh, uh, in insolvency or nearing in insolvency, um, there is actually no positive obligation on a company and its directors um, to uh, take steps to put the company into a formal um, administration or insolvency process. Uh, that's often done because um, directors are concerned about their personal liability, um, so they will um, more often than not either resign or they will uh, resolve to appoint a voluntary administrator, thus uh, drawing a line in the sand with their, with their personal um, liability. Alternatively, um, the, uh, the course may be taken away from the directors um, by the, the views and the actions of the creditors. So creditors 
secured uh, uh, and unsecured uh, can drive a company to an insolvency position simply through their enforcement process. What's happened here is that uh, the government's measures have um, provided relief from the directors for um, personal liability for insolvent trading, so thus taking away the need for directors to put a company into voluntary administration to uh, avoid that liability. And secondly, um, these measures make it difficult for creditors to actually force or to drive a company into, uh, into formal insolvency at this point in time. So that's, that's how they've worked. But none of these measures actually go to fixing the problem or, uh, or providing a solution. Um, the company uh, will still have that same level of debt if they've been unable to, uh, to service it. They may have increased debt during that time uh, and they're going to have to deal with the creditors at some point in the future. And Alistair, can company directors rely solely on these government relief measures to get them through? Uh, it's, this is a difficult, this is a difficult um, uh, one because um, the measures are put in place to allow directors uh, and companies some breathing space, right? Um, the problem is if they rely solely on that breathing space, um, there is an assumption that when these measures come to an end at the end of this um, this calendar year, uh, that uh, business trading and conditions will return to normal. Cash flow will get uh, back to the levels that it previously was at and everything will just work and flow. The company will be able to service their debts and, and, and pay their uh, pay their creditors. Uh, that's a big assumption. Uh, and I think, you know, we're in October now. Uh, I think a lot of those um, companies and businesses are probably realising that um, uh, if there is no obvious solution to their trading issues now, um, the prospect of those um, issues resolving themselves in the next two months and over the Christmas period is probably quite low. Um, so um, that being the case, I think there's a, there's a lot of risk um, to companies and directors on the other side of these measures if they rely solely on them. And the reason being is although there, might, there may have been a pause or a um, a, a moratorium period now, over the other side of it, a lot of the company's problems will be compounded by what's happened uh, during this, this interim period uh, and potentially trying to resolve a solution to them at that point in time um, will be a, a, a lot harder. I guess the other thing too is that um, uh, these relief measures are not a complete shield um, to liability uh, and claims that could be made against companies and, uh, and directors. Um, although providing some relief from um, personal liability for insolvent trading, they don't do anything to uh, protect directors from breach of their ordinary director duties uh, under statute and at, um, at, and at common law, such as um, to act in good faith, to exercise due care and diligence, uh, to act for a proper purpose. Um, you know, and it's often during times of crisis that some of these types of um, duties uh, really become paramount um, because during a time of crisis when money is short, solutions need to be found, um, care really does need to be taken. So to the extent that there are rash decisions or quick decisions being made during this time, there certainly is a risk that although there may be some protection from insolvent trading, um, the protection um, might not necessarily provide any assistance to those directors in terms of decisions they're making now. I think also too um, uh, the, the measures don't uh, operate in circumstances of dishonesty and fraud which we can all probably um, expect uh, anyway. Um, and then finally the point I, I would make on, on, on this question is um, do, do directors really want to rely solely on these measures? And the, the reason I say that is because um, relying on these measures solely um, puts a lot of faith in um, external circumstances and uh, factors. Um, I think what we're starting to see and have seen through this, um, this period is that um, a lot of sophisticated um, boards and companies are actually taking this time to, uh, to take a deep breath and look at their um, scenario, look at their debt levels uh, and are looking to do things now and before these measures come to an end. Um, the reason being is that uh, you know where there are problems, there are there are often opportunities, and uh, I think a number of businesses are saying, look, 
we want to be in a position early next year um, to take real advantage of our market. Um, we want to, to really go hard against our competitors and to do that, we need to have our debt right size, we need to have our operations running efficiently, we need to maintain our critical workforce and we need to keep our creditors at bay. So there are a number of um, companies already taking steps now to try and put those measures in place so that they're perfectly placed to take advantage of the market conditions early next year. Uh, and that may even extend to um, M&A activity as well, um, sourcing funding uh, at this point in time uh, with a view to potentially acquisitions um, early in the year. Okay. Um, Alistair, there's been talk about a wave of tsunami corporate insolvencies once these relief measures come to an end. And I've yes. certainly heard the phrase zombie companies being yes. used in the media. Yes. What do you think the corporate landscape will look like when the relief measures come to an end early next year? Yeah, look, I think, uh, I th I think it's going to be uh, a difficult time for a lot of businesses um, because during, uh, during this, this COVID period when these measures have been in place, um, these businesses have continued to trade um, and have continued to trade um, in circumstances where they're probably not able to pay all of their creditors uh, on time. Uh, there may be creditor enforcement actions um, lurking in the background which haven't been able to progress um, during this, this time. Uh, I think also too, um, you know, JobKeeper has played a, a huge role in allowing companies to maintain their, their workforce. Um, so I guess the concern is that uh, at the end of this period, the relief measures come to an end and um, there's, a, there's a high degree of probability that these companies will actually be in a worse position um, after this in terms of their financial position than they were probably earlier on into, um, into, into this period. Um, now, what that can lead to is that I, I think there will be a, a run on funding. Um, businesses who have not already sourced um, uh, ways to plug some of their liquidity gaps, uh, to pay some of their um, uh, critical or key aspects of their business, employees, uh, trade creditors, uh, maintaining their uh, financial obligations. Um, I think there'll be a run on funding to try and plug some of these, um, these gaps. Now the risk is um, that this may all happen at once uh, and uh, the, um, I guess the uncertainty is how quickly uh, and efficiently some of these um, funding arrangements can be put in place. Uh, I'm already hearing anecdotally that uh, you know, there's been a significant run on funding from the main banks, which has uh, already led to significant delays in terms of uh, considering, processing and approving um, uh, loan facilities or, or extensions. And I think um, if that's the case, I think it's only going to be worse um, early next year. I think also too that will probably lead, you know, to the extent that there are uh, issues uh, or obstacles with obtaining funding from the, the usual financial institutions, uh, it may uh, see um, a, a rise in funding from lower tier lenders and potentially lenders of last resort. Um, now that may result in companies taking on uh, funding uh, at uh, very high interest uh, terms and, and repayment obligations. Uh, and potentially with significant consequences uh, if any of those um, repayments are not made. Um, so I, th I think there's a significant amount of risk there. Um, also too, um, we are starting to see significant COVID related claims, disputes and, and litigation starting to arise. Um, and I think that's only going to increase. Uh, the reason being that uh, you know, COVID has caused um, significant amounts of delays and disruption to, uh, to businesses uh, and uh, I think now a lot of organisations are starting to, to look internally, look at some of their, uh, their problems and concerns and, uh, and how they might uh, have remedies against uh, others and trading partners in relation to, uh, to some, of those, um, some of those amounts. So I think we'll probably see a significant amount of litigation starting to, um, to arise um, then. The other risk is that um, if this is all happening at once, uh, the prospect of um, uh, restructuring options uh, starts to become a little bit limited because the market could be flooded with distress and similar situations, um, you know, probably leading to potentially a shortage in funding, uh, potentially fire sale on assets, so impacting uh, valuation of, uh, of assets and the like. Um, and, uh, and so I think 
the, the prospect of all of this happening at the same time and running smoothly and efficiently, I think is going to be problematic. Uh, and the issue then is um, uh, whether some of these uh, traditional restructuring type options um, are not only available, but are able to be accessed quickly enough to assist the companies uh, within their own critical time frames. I think that's, that's, that's an uncertainty at this point in time. So your advice to your clients at the moment is um, there is some heavy lifting to do between now and say Christmas in yes. anticipation of some of these um, support measures being wound back by the yeah, government? Yes, most, most definitely. Um, and we've also seen um, the introduction of some new small business insolvency laws which are intended to um, assist that sector of the market. Um, how do you see those operating? Yeah, look, this is an interesting new development um, where Australia has um, uh, selected uh, uh, an aspect of, uh, of US style um, Chapter 11 um, restructuring um, designed to enable a company to, to largely continue on trading in the hands of the uh, company's directors rather than having an external uh, administrator or insolvency practitioner running um, the restructure. Um, with a view to um, a restructure involving a creditor compromise and, and, and restructuring of debt. Now, unlike the US, the Australian model is largely focused on small businesses. Uh, and the reason being, and by small businesses, I'm talking about businesses with liabilities under a million dollars. The reason being is that uh, uh, the government has taken the view that the current system uh, that we have in Australia, which is which is a good system, is not um, a one size fits all, and it is often probably better suited to larger organisations and larger restructures than smaller. Um, the reason being because of some of the timeframes, um, the cost and expense uh, in, involved in the uh, complexity of the process. So this new process is designed to simplify, fast track and keep the cost down um, with a view to providing small businesses with uh, an opportunity to restructure and if they can't restructure, uh, to go into liquidation and to fast track the liquidation uh, with a view to uh, returns being made available more quickly to, um, to creditors. Um, will it assist? Look, I think it's a, I think it's a positive step uh, and will provide some assistance uh, I guess my reservations uh, with the system as proposed uh, are probably that, um, look, firstly, uh, there is a level of sophistication involved in these um, new measures, even though they are designed to be simple and, and relatively straightforward. Um, my concern is whether um, uh, that level of sophistication will be appreciated enough and utilised sufficiently at a small business level. Now, a lot of these restructures, or all these, sorry, all of these restructures in this in this sort of a scenario, will need to be guided by uh, an insolvency practitioner. So, although the directors uh, will be in control of the company, they will be taking advice from an insolvency practitioner um, with a view to putting a proposal to the company's creditors, um, which is uh, designed to uh, to generate a, a better outcome. So, there will be a level of assistance. Um, the question is how much. Um, uh, of that process is embraced by the, the creditor group. Um, and to me, you know, th th that, that remains to be seen because uh, if these restructures and this process is to be successful for restructures, um, creditors are going to need to um, very quickly understand this process uh, and embrace this process in circumstances where uh, the directors of the company who ultimately led the company to this position and potentially a scenario where these creditors are not going to get paid in full are still in charge and are saying to these creditors, trust us, work with us, uh, we're getting the right advice uh, and this is the best proposal we can, we can offer. Uh, I think a lot of faith and trust is then put in the creditors to say, look, we understand the process, we understand what you're doing here, um, we agree and we're happy to, uh, to vote, compromise our debt support the process, allow the company to restructure. If the creditors are not able to trust and work with a company going through 
um, this sort of a process in circumstances where the directors are still in control, um, then a lot of these uh, restructures will quickly go into voluntary administration or even or even liquidation. So um, I think we'll, we'll watch on certainly with interest in the new year as to how a lot of these um, these scenarios play out. Um, but as I said, I think the the idea is a good one. Uh, the um, the part that remains to be seen is whether um, this uh, type of process is um, is really suitable to small businesses, uh, or whether it's still um, of greater benefit to, uh, to, to to medium size or even larger businesses um, with um, with high profile advisors involved. Uh, just a reminder for participants that we do have the opportunity for you to submit uh, questions through the Q and A tool. Um, so if there's any questions anyone's got on anything else that has said or anything that I'll say. Um, feel free to type in a question and we'll see if we can uh, respond to it during the course of the webinar this morning. Um, Alistair, is there anything companies should be looking to do now or can they wait until these relief measures come to an end? Yeah, look, most definitely, and I think we've, we've probably touched on some of these points al al already, um, but I think, I think companies and directors at the moment should be asking themselves some, some key questions. Um, you know, firstly, you know, but for these measures, are we insolvent? Or are we likely to be insolvent when these measures come? If that's the case, then I think um, they should be taking steps to um, to try and minimise their personal liability, but also to um, look at ways to um, to try and uh, enable the company to continue to uh, to trade during those circumstances, uh, which is, is is largely going to um, to revolve around what they can do with their debt and their creditor position. Um, and you know, also to you know, beyond these measures. So we're talking about um, you know, one January onwards. Um, is the company or or other companies expecting that their cash flow will return to um, to normal normal levels, such that they can maintain the critical parts of their business, um, you know, including maintaining their workforce? Uh, and I think if the answer to a lot of these questions is no, or it's unclear at the moment. Um, then you know I think uh, I, I would certainly encourage um, companies and their boards to be um, looking to um, to resolve some of these issues or to at least put a plan in place now um, so that um, uh, so that the company is a reasonable position uh, and um, prepared uh, with a number of measures in place or able to be put in place um, to um, to guard against some of these issues that are likely to arise. Um, during that period, or, um, or or really into that um, that period. Now, some of those solutions might be looking at um, uh, credit compromise arrangements. Now, putting in place um, forbearance or um, standstill arrangements with creditors, um, with with a view to uh, uh, agreeing or, or tying up those creditors from um, uh, taking enforcement steps um, during the forbearance period, provided certain conditions such as repayment um, terms are being being met. Um, it could be engaging with banks now with a view to um, you know, perhaps refinancing or extending um, facilities. Uh, a number of um, companies, and I've seen this on a, on a few of my matters, uh, are looking at uh, employment funding arrangements. Um, I've seen um, some businesses look at um, pop-up funding uh, on top of the JobKeeper allowances uh, during this COVID period. Uh, and I'm expecting um, at the end of this that uh, some businesses will actually need to find some funding to maintain their workforce um, for a period of time. Uh, often those funding arrangements are, uh, are put in place with a view to taking advantage of a uh, priority creditor entitlement should the business go into uh, to, uh, a formal insolvency at some point in the future where the funder would step into the shoes of the employee uh, and their entitlements. Uh, also, to another key aspect uh, is um, is to do with um, with safe harbour and the safe harbour regime. So the safe harbour regime is is, is not related to um, the uh, the current COVID measures. It's been in place for a couple of years now, uh, and, and what it does is it, it provides a similar protection um, to directors uh, for personal liability for insolvent trading, um, provided certain cr uh, key criteria are being met, uh, and those criteria are that the ATO repayments uh, are up to date or being maintained. Uh, employee payments are being maintained. 
uh, the, um, the the company and the directors are getting uh, some uh, advice and assistance from a suitably qualified insolvency uh, specialist uh, with a view to developing a plan designed to generate a better outcome uh, for the company than a, than a liquidation scenario. So that regime is already in place and can be taken advantage of. Um, what we've seen during this uh, this COVID period is that companies and directors looking for absolutely um, full protection have entered into safe harbour on top of the current um, current COVID uh, uh, measures and relief uh, in place. Uh, and the reason a lot of them have done that is not only just to, to bolster some of the, the existing protections, but uh, there is no um, time limit uh, related to the COVID measures when you're looking at a safe harbour. So if you're in a safe harbour now, you can uh, continue in that safe harbour, provided the criteria are being met beyond um, the end of these current measures, so 31 uh, December and, and, and into, um, into the new year. So um, that's already happening, but we're also expecting, I think over the next month or two in this calendar year, a number of businesses will be looking to enter into a safe harbour so that that personal liability protection uh, is with those, with those um, directors going into, uh, into the new year so that uh, to the extent that the business has issues, uh, let's say in the first six months of, of, of next year, um, that the directors are comfortable that they can continue to trade the business uh, with a view to working through a restructuring plan without exposing themselves to, to personal liability. Um, a couple of advantages of, um, of Safe Harbour 2, um, as I said, you know, it's protection from personal liability. Uh, it's available any time, not associated with these government-related um, measures, um, but also too, it doesn't need to be disclosed. So if a company is in Safe Harbour, that can happen uh, confidentially uh, and in a way that uh, is not disclosed to their market or their, or their trading partners. Uh, so a company can go into Safe Harbour and come out the other side without the outside world seeing it. So for that reason, uh, I, I think uh, also a number of businesses uh, and uh, directors have been quite attracted to the uh, scenario of a, a Safe Harbour and I think will into the, uh, into the future. All right. Well, thank you, Alistair, for that overview. I'm now going to hand over the uh, interviewing responsibilities to you um, so we can talk about JobKeeper 2.0 and um, deal with some of the more uh, particular issues in relation to managing employees um, as we get them back to work and as the JobKeeper scheme comes off. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, thanks, Sol. Look, um, we obviously uh, know a lot about JobKeeper, I guess, as, um, as, as, as a concept and how JobKeeper 1 has, um, has worked. And it, I think, uh, by and large, the, um, uh, the, the industry comments seem quite positive. Um, as to um, as to how it has worked, but what can you tell us about the key changes to JobKeeper 2.0 that uh, you know that employees should know about um, at this point in time? Yeah, look, thanks, Alistair. Look, we've identified four things to talk about today in terms of JobKeeper 2.0. Um, the payment rates that have changed, um, changes to employee eligibility, changes to business eligibility, and some things to note about JobKeeper enabling direction. So firstly, in terms of payment rates, there's been an adjustment as um, most people who are participating in the JobKeeper scheme would be aware of. So for the period from 29 Jan September to 3 January next year, the payment rates are now in a uh, two-tier basis, depending on the number of hours per week an employee works. So it's $1,200 payment per fortnight for all eligible employees whose normal working hours are 20 hours or more per week, and $750 per fortnight for employees whose normal working hours are less than 20 hours per week. Then from the 4th of January next year through to the 28th of March, and the 28th of March is the date on which the scheme is currently scheduled to end, the payment will reduce to $1,000 for eligible employees whose normal working hours are 20 hours or more per, per week, and $650 um, per fortnight for employees whose normal working hours are less than 20 hours per week. Now, in, in, in terms of the concept of normal working hours, this will be determined by looking at how many hours an employee worked on average in the four weeks before 1 March 2020. Now, the Commissioner of Taxation will have a discretion to set an alternative test where an employee's hours were not usual during those four weeks. 
for example, where the employee was on leave, was volunteering during the bushfire season, or was not employed for all or part of February 2020. The second key change is in relation to employee eligibility. Employees are now able to access JobKeeper if they've been working for an eligible employer since 1 July 2020, whereas under JobKeeper 1, the original date for employment was 1 March 2020. And there has been, this further easing has been in relation to the difficult conditions that have been faced in Victoria primarily. In terms of business eligibility, businesses and not-for-profits will still need to prove that they have experienced a reduction of turnover of 50% for businesses that have an aggregated turnover of more than a billion, 30% for businesses that have an aggregated annual turnover of a billion or less, and 15% for Australian charities and not-for-profit commissions, registered charities excluding schools and universities. Employers seeking to claim JobKeeper payments from the 28th of September 2020 will be required to reassess their eligibility for JobKeeper 2.0 with reference to their actual turnover in the September 2020 quarter, rather than their projected GST turnover, which was the test under JobKeeper 1. When JobKeeper 2.0 was first announced, businesses were required to demonstrate a downturn in both the June and September 2020 quarters. However, the easing of restrictions to accommodate Victoria, again, means businesses will only need to demonstrate they have met the turnover test in, September, in the September 2020 quarter, as opposed to the two previous quarters. And fourthly, the job, some changes to the JobKeeper enabling directions. So the ability of eligible employers to give JobKeeper enabling directions to eligible employees will continue with JobKeeper 2.0. Currently, employers can give JobKeeper enabling directions to employees on stand out or to perform other duties, change location of work, take annual leave and reduce their hours to as little as zero. These industrial flexibilities will remain in force until March 2021, except for direction to take annual leave. Controversially, businesses that were previously eligible for JobKeeper but do not re-qualify for JobKeeper 2.0, which will be known as legacy employers, employees, um, will have continued access to JobKeeper enabling directions if they can demonstrate their turnover has declined by 10% or more in relevant quarters compared to last year. Legacy employers will be able to give a JobKeeper enabling direction subject to the following criteria. Firstly, the reduction to an employee's hours of work cannot be below 60% of the employee's ordinary hours of work as at 1 March. Secondly, employees cannot be required to work less than two hours on a workday. And finally, employees must be given seven days written notice before a JobKeeper enabling direction is issued up from the previous notice period of three days. So, um, what options will businesses have available to manage their workforce if they simply do not have the volume of business or, or cash flow to, uh, to maintain their current workforce? Thanks, Alistair. The So we'll have the JobKeeper enabling directions continuing to apply up until 28 March 2021. Um, and as we've discussed, there is the potential for those arrangements to be extended. Um, but beyond that, employers should be thinking now about things around flexible working arrangements. So for example, um, thinking about whether or not there are, there are roles within the business that could be formed on a job sharing basis, on a part-time basis, um, and, and looking at whether or not employers can access additional annual leave, um, whether or not they want to introduce a policy to enable employees to buy additional annual leave. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we've noticed, um, certainly from the West Australian experience, um, given we've been uh, back at work for some time now, is that uh, a lot of our clients have noticed that they have accumulated a lot of annual leave. Right. And so we're starting to talk to clients about how um, employers can be encouraged and or directed to use some of that annual leave. Yes. Obviously, it becomes a significant liability for business, um, but equally, the purpose of annual leave is to give an employee an opportunity to have a break from work and to yes. refresh, and it can be part of a fatigue management program. Yes. The problem being, of course, that um, there are limited travel opportunities mm. um, for people to travel overseas and potentially in and out of um, their state or territory. So the need for people to take annual leave um, or the ability to, for people to use their annual leave in a way they want to is limited and so we're seeing um, a deferral of, of, of leave being taken. Um, 
there is also um, some issues around, you know, whether or not um, people want to cash out annual leave. So cashing out annual leave is also an opportunity. But then, of course, if an employee cashes out annual leave, um, they are foregoing that opportunity to have a, a, a decent break from work, yes. which is, is really important from both a physical point of view and also from a psychological yes. point of view. I guess the other thing about accessing leave is that um, now that employ a lot of employees are working remotely and working from yeah. home, um, they may not be coming into the office um, you know, five days a week and they may not be coming in four days a week. Yes. Um, so uh, they have got a little bit more spare time, a little bit more freedom and, and they can use that flexibility mm -hmm. to uh, manage their lifestyle. So you know, that's clearly a, um, an issue. Um, Beyond looking at whether or not you can introduce some flexible working arrangements, um, then uh, employers will have to start looking at options around whether or not they need to vary enterprise agreements oh, yes. um, to provide themselves with greater flexibility in terms of how they manage their their workforce. And look, um, probably at the pointy end of the whole, um, at the end of the stick, will be having to consider whether or not they need to go through a reduction. A reduction of their workforce, yes, um, which will involve a restructuring and um, potentially redundancies. Yes, uh, there may be voluntary redundancy opportunities. It may be a forced redundancy scenario. Um, so there's a number of different options there um, for employers um, to consider. And I guess in the same vein that you were talking about, directors should be now thinking about how do they operate um, once the end of um, a lot of the government support measures. Yes. Um, come to an end. Um, equally, we're doing a lot of work with clients now around workforce planning, mm -hmm. um, looking at what sort of flexibility that they have within their contracts of employment, their policies, their yes. awards, their agreements, um, and starting to help them look at you know what different levers that they've got within their business yeah. that they may have to pull, um, you know, sort of from March onwards, um, certainly in April around you know um, managing uh, employee expectations, being able to continue to um, meet their trading requirements. Um, there's also been a real reluctance for some employers to not um, uh, take steps to reduce employee hours of work. Mm -hmm. um, the fear in some industries that the employees will leave and, and find another job. Right. Um, and so there are. We've heard about it. There are some sectors of the industry of the economy that are really struggling to find workers. Yes. Um, in part because um, of the JobKeeper allowance, which was a, clearly an unintended consequence. Yes. Um, but in some areas that have been dependent upon, um, you know, overseas um, labour, for example. So we see it in the fruit picking industry yes. at the moment um, a shortage of labour in the country areas. Yes. Um, if one looks to what they've been doing in New Zealand, um, the New Zealand government has said, look, their wage subsidy scheme, which is similar to JobKeeper, will continue to apply. Um, but if you happen to go and work in a remote area um, and you can earn a full-time wage, we'll continue to pay you the subsidy on top of that. So oh, right. there are um, there are some novel things that are happening yes. that we can learn from overseas as well as just from the experiences that some of the states are having that have um, emerged out of um, the sort of lockdown sooner than um, some of the other states and territories. Yes, okay. Look, it is interesting. I mean, certainly from an insolvency perspective, I've seen a number of um, scenarios already where uh, if businesses uh, are heavily reliant on a large workforce, um, it's it's um, you know some really difficult um, considerations and decisions having to be made around how that's how that's balanced. Because um, if there are significant uh, employee entitlements um, uh, that that could be due on redundancy or, or, or termination or the like. Um, you know, if those liabilities were to hit now, a number of those businesses would probably struggle to um, to come back from that scenario. So, um, but at the same time, you know, they may want to hold on to um, to critical staff. So, what we're seeing is it's it, it can be a very difficult balance um, to keep critical staff to um, to perhaps encourage some staff to have have leave, um, not others. Um, and you know, there's there's not going to be one size that fits all here. Yeah, absolutely. And look on those. Um Termination liabilities, of course, if you've got a large workforce and no one's taken leave for 12 months, yeah, um, then you're likely to have a significant um, could be crippling significant leave liability balance to deal with as well. Yes, yes. Okay, um, I guess an issue that uh, that I've heard a number of um, clients talking about, and uh, you know, 
seen firsthand uh, as well. Um, during this, this COVID period, a number of um, uh, organisations and their staff have worked remotely and, uh, and home. Uh, and the transition back into the office um, you know, can be quite slow uh, and, uh, and, and, and difficult. Um, to the extent that employers are looking to get their staff back into the office, um, you know, is there anything that they should be, um, you know, considering at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, our experience um, helping clients with this issue is that it's a really difficult exercise. Mm. Um, so they say, look, on average, it takes about three months to form a new habit, and once you form that new habit, it becomes yes. part of your, your lifestyle. Um, so we've had a situation uh, now um, since, you know, April-ish, May-ish, um, where people have been working um, flexibly from home. Mm -hmm. So they well and truly passed through that three-month period and it's yes. become um, a habitual part of how, yes. they, um, how they operate. For, not for all um, in industries and all um, employers, but certainly for a large number of them. Um, so we now have a situation where we've normalised working from home. Um, most sophisticated clients have um, made sure their employees have, you know, the full suite of IT that they need to function effectively from home. Um, so, it, you know, and I think in a lot of areas, um, the, the lesson learned has been, well, we really haven't had a, a significant drop off in productivity. Yes. Everything seems to be going okay. Um, and so it seems to be working. Yes. Um, now, you know, we then have government um, wanting to encourage people and we've got um, to return back to the return back into offices in a, in a, in a yes. place like Western Australia, we've got um, clearly our, our state government would like more people back into the Perth CBD. Um, we've got um, you know the retail and hospitality sectors really wanting people to come back into the cities mm -hmm. and into the um, in, back to work in the um, in other locations. Um, but unfortunately, I think in the short to medium term. Mm -hmm. um, people are going to be reluctant to want to come back into the office full time. They've adapted their lifestyles around working remotely. Um, and, you know, most people you hear from um, seem to enjoy the additional flexibility and the autonomy associated mm -hmm. with being able to work from home. Yes. Um, whether or not you can direct your employees back to work um, is a question that will have a different answer for each context. Yes. Um, there will be some uh, businesses that will have published flexible working policies um, that will need to be taken into account. Um, there'll also be need, need to be consideration for some vulnerable, vulnerable workers. Yes. So employees that have predisposed to um, illness or of a certain age that feel vulnerable and or exposed to COVID-19. So mm -hmm. coming up with a, a nuanced approach for dealing with vulnerable employees is um, really important as well. Um, one other issue to consider is in the larger cities is Public transport. Yes, um, yes. So you know, we clients were assisting in Sydney, for example. One of the big issues they're facing is um, my staff just don't want to get on a packed mm. bus or a packed train. Yes. So um, working out arrangements to enable um, employees to actually travel into large cities and feel safe um, is going to be, you know, a thing that um, a lot of employees with CBD presence is going to are going to have to consider. So look, there's a number of things there to think about, but um, you know, a recent survey of the top 100 CEOs of the UK, um, mm -hmm. in the UK, um, the overwhelming outcome from that that, um, that survey was that 75% um, of them were now designing their businesses around an expectation that people will work on average three and a half to four days per week in the office and the rest of the time will be right. working flexibly. So right. they've, they are pivoting towards that has been their new normal and, and designing their businesses around it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, you touched on sort of the vulnerable and, uh, and, and issues of um, safety before. Um, would you have any advice to employers um, about how they might ensure their workplace is, is safe, particularly from a COVID perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and look, this is really practical advice, um, Alistair, and things that we've learned on our own experience in having people come back to work at Clayton Utes, but also talking to um, clients about. So there are really, um, there are two aspects to this. Um, there are the um, physical um, steps that need yeah. to be taken and there are the psychological yeah. um, considerations that need to be had. So look, basic things in terms of um, physical safety, um, having 
um, if you've got a hot desking workplace, mm -hmm. making sure that people are socially distanced in accordance with state and territory regulations. Yes. Um, access to hand sanitizer, access to sanitizer wipes so that screens and phones can be yes. wiped down. Um, providing extra cleaning in your office. Um, if you have an office gym, making sure that you know there are rules in place to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, work vehicles, making sure that um, you know consideration is given to how you manage work um, vehicles. And look, in terms of the psychological safety mm -hmm. of employees, which is really um, critical, is um, it's all about making sure people feel safe coming to work. Yes. So making sure they've got access to um, your EAP provider, um, so they can speak to a counsellor if they need to over the phone. Actually getting the counsellors to come into the office so that they can have a face-to-face -face session with a counsellor if they're feeling stressed about yes. um, returning to work post-COVID or. Um, Consider whether or not you're going to have a Christmas party this year. Mm. I mean, are you going to have those sorts of functions where you're going to have mm. large gatherings? Um, being aware of the mere spectre of a restructure in the workplace. Yes. So people are going to be coming back to work thinking, look, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I've got an uncertain future. Yes. Um, what's my job security look like? Yes. That, that in itself is going to create um, some uncertainty for people. Sure. And I guess look, with, with people coming um, back into um, to the workplace more often, I think having spent um, spent time working from home, as you said, like it, it can become a habit, particularly um, you know where um, you know the, the setup at home is great and they feel very comfortable in that environment. Um, so as a result, we're probably going to see more staff ask about flexible working arrangements. Would you have any suggestions as to um, to how employers might handle? Those sorts of scenarios. Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, I completely agree with the the suggestion that we will see an uptick in yeah. um, requests for flexible working arrangements. Um, so, the development of a flexible working policy is really critical. Um, so, there are some guidelines around it. You you need to have a framework if you're going to allow people to work flexibly. Um, some of the things we need to consider are um, if my employee is going to work at home, are they working in a safe environment? Yes. And, and really what we're talking there about is ergonomics. So do they have a desk? Do they have a proper desk chair? Do they have um, a, a, an environment which is you know, free from, sort of, from hazards? And um, Safe Work Australia um, on its website has some great guides for employers around um, some tips and tricks and some checklists that you give to your employees around um, ascertaining whether or not they've got a safe workplace at home. So I'd really encourage participants today to have a look at the Safe Work Australia website, download some of the information they've got and think about whether or not they need to offer that to their employees. Mm -hmm. um, look, every, everything we do, um, in the, uh, most of us anyway, is going to involve access to IT hardware and software. Yes. So making sure you've got um, IT systems that, that will work and that will operate effectively. And then one thing to think about um, as well as um, depending on the di the demographics of your workforce, you might have um, a young workforce. Mm. Um, you might be in a professional services environment where you're going to have um, access to confidential information. And you know we've already heard the stories around um, you know young professionals living in a shared house environment. Yeah. Three or four of them around the the, the dining table or with their laptops um, doing their work. And so one thing to think about is um, if my employee is going to be working from home. Um, is the confidential information that I've got and that I'm sharing with them and they're using to do their work going to be safe? Yes. And thinking about some reminders around confidentiality, you know, leaving laptops open, leaving hard copies of documents around the place, yes. even conversations they might be having on their mobile phones with clients or with customers or with staff or suppliers, um, making sure that that information is, is really um, considered carefully. Um, we've already touched on this, so. Uh, Careful consideration of vulnerable employees. Yes. Um, if you have an employee that presents as vulnerable, um, the key to this is to make sure that you're taking specialist medical advice in terms of how to manage them. To make sure you don't expose them to any further harm, mm -hmm. um, and consider what kind of steps you can reasonably take to facilitate them working remotely or flexibly, given that they have a vulnerability. Yes. Um, and and look, finally, thinking about you know. Large client events, um, large customer events, large work events, um, whether or not you're going to proceed with those. And we mentioned before the Christmas mm. party, um, but you know, Melbourne Cup's coming up soon. Mm. Some workplaces will have a Melbourne Cup luncheon. If you're going to have a Melbourne you know, Cup luncheon, um, you, you know, what sort of 
steps you're going to take around um, making sure that staff that work flexibly are able to participate will they yes. come into the office and then if you are having a surge of numbers into your office mm. then thinking about um, thinking about you know what steps you need to take to make sure that that party is a safe party yes yes um, well Alistair I think we're just about hard up against it there in terms of yeah. time um, we um, we had a couple of questions come through um, we might just one of them just quickly Alistair we've got about a minute left yeah. Um, we've got this question, if a company is ASX listed and goes into safe harbour, surely that has to be announced to the market? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the, the, I guess the common misconception with safe harbour is that uh, safe harbour is a, a formal process, um, you know, similar to a voluntary administration receivership or, or liquidation, um, but that's actually not the case. What a safe harbour is, is it's an exclusion from personal liability for directors for trading a company whilst insolvent. It's called a safe harbour. That's a, a, I guess a catchy, catchy way of describing it. And it's, um, you know, it's a, a, a phrase that's been used um, overseas, particularly in the US for, for a number of years. But all it's concerned about is, is the director liability. So it is um, a, a, an advice um, that's based on directors satisfying or causing the company to satisfy um, certain critical um, criteria. Um, with a view to um, uh, attracting the protection that the legislation has for those directors from their own personal liability. Uh, it is, um, it is uh, not something that, that applies to the, the company as a whole. Um, so I think the way of looking at it is it's director liability, not, uh, not company liability. And that being the case, um, it, it, it doesn't need to, um, to be disclosed. It's not a disclosure. Thanks, Alistair. Um, on behalf of Alistair and myself, I'd like to thank everyone for um, logging on this morning and joining us for this webinar, and also take the opportunity to thank our IT team and our client and market team that helped pull together this morning's session. If you have any uh, questions or want any further information about today's presentation, then feel free to contact Christy Rule from Clayton U2's whose contact details are all set out on the original invite you received. Again, on behalf of Alistair and I, I'd just like to say thank you and wish everyone a very good day. Thank you.